Thursday morning. I'm Pixie. I'm Seth. And I'm Pyrosim. And welcome to Nerd Talk. This week, stuff. I played Mark Oshiro, the gay blogger who is, you know, kind of... Is he tall? He seems like he's tall. Pixie's met him in person. He's not tall. He's not tall? Okay, well, Mark Oshiro is not tall. But he's also not a video game. What actually is a video game is Mark of the Ninja, which is what I did play. Okay. So you you managed to play this on PC because previously this was an Xbox Live exclusive. It was an Xbox Live exclusive, but I feel like it was maybe even for less than a month. Uh, usually right. they have like one month exclusivities, but it might have just been a technical limitation. Ooh, I'm completely. Oh, but at okay the time that. that we're recording this on Tuesday, it is uh, Mark's birthday. So happy birthday, Mark! Go Should check out his blog at markreads.net and markwatches.net. And, and also there's MarkPlays.net. Mark, plays. Mark, should, Mark should do a Mark Plays of Mark of the Ninja. The main character does not really have a name, but everybody calls him Mark after his tattoo, which is a, which is a central plot point. But that's odd, because really the way that it works in the canon of the story is ninjas who are dishonored receive this Mark, which slowly drives them insane. So, well, like, I don't why think would it's that necessarily that name? they're dishonored, but... In times of great need, the clan calls upon a sacrificial lamb to accept the mark, and that this will kill them, and they're expected to commit suicide imme- well, immediately after their mission is accomplished, because the mark is too dangerous. It has crazy psychogenic chemicals in it, but it lets you do magic stuff like psychically see things through walls and even teleport when you have the full mark. You know, like you do. So, Mark of the Ninja is a 2D action game, a stealth act. Why did I say action game? It's a stealth game. It's not even an action at all. There's like a tiny action sequence that you can do if you get caught, but realistically, as soon as you get detected, you hit the start button on your controller, and you tab down to where it says restart from checkpoint, and then you try not to get caught again. <laughs> the game is like, seriously, why are you being a bad ninja? <laughs> yes. It's kind of... One of the things that people say they don't like about the stealth genre most of the time is that you tend to play small sequences over and over and over again because you'll get, like, two or three minutes through a sequence and make a bunch of progress, and then you get spotted over the course of, like, four seconds, and then you have to go back to the checkpoint and try and do everything you just did again. The checkpointing is relatively generous in Mark of the Ninja, so you never lose, like, more than five minutes, but each five-minute section, you might be trying five or six times. One of the things that this game has gotten buzz about is the fact that it gives you a lot of information about how you're hidden and what guards can detect. And so, if you are running, your foot will hit the ground, and at the spot of your foot hitting the ground, a circle will erupt. It's just like a little gray, semi-transparent circle, and it will spread out to a radius on the screen that is how loud the noise was, and anybody inside the circle can hear you and will go wander over to investigate. And your character has two different sprites based on whether or not you are in shadow. There's one where you're illuminated and one where you're shaded. Uh, Those are the only two states there are. And every guard, when they're walking around, has, like, this very obvious cone in front of their face that only extends like two feet because all of these guards have bad vision apparently and if you're shaded the only way they can see you is that if you are literally inside their little vision cone and so it is very easy to know when you're detected or not which is good because you feel like you actually did something wrong when you have to restart this five minute segment for the fourth time but on the same On the other side of that coin, it feels kind of mechanical. It's like, uh, I'm not thinking about if this guard can hear me. I'm thinking about if this circle is touching that sprite. The movement is really cool because it is a 2D action game. They kind of have to be liberal with how you can move or else there would not be many ways to get around. And so you can basically stick to everything. It depends on the level. There are like some very rare roof Uh, or ceilings that you can't stick to, but otherwise, you can just grab onto any wall or any ceiling and just stay there indefinitely. It's not like you have to keep moving in a wall run in order to not fall down the wall. 
you can just grab onto a wall and hold, or a ceiling. And so, uh, the funny thing about that is it makes the movement seem a little strange when you're first getting used to it, because you're like, I want to walk off this ledge to get down to this lower area, and it's like, nope, you just stick to the wall, and then you stick to the other wall, and then you're climbing back up on the ceiling, and you're like, I'm stuck to the ceiling, how do I just fall down? And you adapt to it fairly quickly once you're used to playing it, though. It has great controller support. In fact, I don't even know what the PC controls are, even though I played it on the PC, because the what I did is I launched the game and I got into a mission without plugging in or turning on my controller. And once I was already that far, I then plugged in and turned on my controller, and it was like, oh, yeah, okay, I recognize that you have a controller, go for it. Uh, that is great, because there's games can go either way on that. Assassin's Creed is actually one that kind of sucks about that. You have to have the controller all set up before you start the game, or it will never work. It will drop right into that. Uh, cutscenes are skippable. That's like always the sign of a good game. You don't want to skip the cutscenes because they're like beautiful hand-animated uh, comic panels. But if you are perhaps playing a mission over and over again, which there's plenty of reason to do, there's like nine collectibles in every mission, and... I didn't get all of them on any single pass through any of the missions, and I beat the game. Uh, you probably will want to play the game twice to get the full experience. I put about 11 hours into it, and I beat just the standard mode. But I get the impression that the standard mode is sort of the tutorial, and the New Game Plus is the real game. And the trick about the New Game Plus is that it takes away those sound cones... And your psychic ability to detect what the guards are interested in, and all of the just really deep information about the environment that it's giving you all the time. So you kind of have to think about the game more. And then it also does another thing which is kind of crazy, which is that you can't see things that are behind you in New Game Plus mode. Like, it's a strange change from normal, because in normal, if you're standing under a streetlight, the streetlight will look like you're the camera and you're looking at it from the side. The streetlight projects down on both sides of you. But in New Game Plus, you'll only see the part of the streetlight's beams that are cast in front of you, and behind you it'll just be grayed out. Because yes, it's illuminated there, but the ninja can't see it, so the player can't see it. That tends to make everything very dark a lot, and it would be just about impossible to get through that mode if you hadn't already played all these missions on normal mode. I think that was a fairly intelligent way to structure it. Uh, $15, uh, 11 to 22 hour experience, depending on how dedicated you are, so that's a pretty good value proposition. Uh, you sneak around, you kill people to make it so that you, they can't see you anymore, and the story is kinda crazy. There's a hard choice at the very end of it that I kind of, when I got to the last mission of the game, I sat in my chair trying to decide which choice to make for, like, three minutes. About equivalent to how long it took me to decide on my final decision in Mass Effect. Hmm. Actually, I, I kind of made my final decision in Mass Effect pretty quickly. I, I might have given it one minute, but... Yeah, the final decision in Mass Effect not so, the, didn't take me all that long. It was the, uh... In Mass Effect 2, the destroy versus converting the Geth. That took oh me Oh my, while. that's my favorite choice in the whole series. I don't know, I kind of appreciated the support the Geth or support the, uh... Uh, the Quarians in Mass Effect well, 3, because if you did not play that one exactly right, one of those two races would be wiped out. That choice is certainly really amazing and deeply interesting inside the fiction. The thing that I like about the um, converting or destroying the Geth is that it is sort of an interesting philosophical question even outside of Mass Effect about the nature of free will, because it's like Okay, these rogue geth, I can basically mind control them, and is that, what is the ethics of mind control, is basically just the straight up question. And after sitting around for about three minutes, I decided that, yes, of course I'm gonna mind control these geth, cause otherwise lots of people are gonna die. How did you fall on that, Pixie? Yeah, I kind of came to that conclusion too, because otherwise I didn't want to. I wanted to have as much resources on my side as possible, and also, you know, kind of not doing violence. Right. I was I was a very nonviolent shepherd for the most part. Uh huh. And then I kind of felt better about my decision 
after playing 3, because 3 sort of insinuates that the rogue geth from 2 were already being manipulated by the reapers. So it's like, they were already mind-controlled, I'm just mind-controlling them differently. It's not like they were rogue geth of their own free will, the way it was when it was the well, quarians versus the geth. I'd say Mark of the Ninja is a pretty good game. Alright, glad to hear it. I know you would... 8 of 10 stars. Nobody... Ooh, I, I'm looking at my notes, and I realize there's something I forgot to mention, which is that there's a couple of really sly Metal Gear Solid references. Ooh. There's an achievement called Tactical Espionage Action, which I thought was pretty classy. Excellent. And there is one little stealth upgrade you can get that is a cardboard box that you hide under. That is awesome. Like, they're not really, um, front and center. They're not in your face about it. But it's like, yeah, you can hide under this cardboard box. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Sen, I hear you've watched some interesting trailers recently. Quite. I've uh, been getting really excited about Bioshock Infinite because I was such a huge fan of the original for creating a shooter that did something unique with its narrative, but also something unique with its setting and its playstyle. That it embraced the idea that, yeah, you have to creatively use these uh, psychic powers that you've been given while also just bloody shooting things sometimes. The original Bioshock was a very interesting game. Right, and so I was kind of disappointed when Bioshock 2 came out, and it was great. So we're barely expanding on the original and adding a narrative that's less interesting in the same setting. Great, thanks. But now, yeah, the trick about Bioshock 2 is like, well, it's it's all right, but it's not it's not it's anything nothing special, new, or interesting. Bioshock 2 is Assassin's Creed Revelations right. to Bioshock's Assassin's Creed Brotherhood. Whereas Bioshock Infinite is introducing brand new mechanics in addition to the plasmids. Like, you've got the, the grappling repel hook that you use to not only attack enemies, but cling to lines that slide you around the city. Uh, you've got Elizabeth's aid helping you out, which to date you've never had in Bioshock an actual... NPC assisting you before. It's been a very lonely game. Uh, unless you count the, like, little sisters randomly handing you things as real AI assistants. Um, <laughs> but no, Bioshock Infinite actually is playing on all of these really interesting mechanics. The idea of multiple time streams, uh, Elizabeth's powers and the nature of them, the floating city. Uh, yeah, it's going to a kind of crazy setting. When right, you were like, playing the original Bioshock, you're like, I am in an underwater city that is, like, the 1870s, and there's all this objectivism, and it is, it's all crazy. And then Bioshock 2 is like, well, the objectivism is kind of worn off, we already covered that. Yeah, I'm underwater again. I was underwater before, so it's not this crazy. Right. But, but now, no, it is a floating city, and it's all... They are crazy in, like, imperialist America in full swing. Like, if you look at some of the propaganda posters that got made for that game, it's insane. Yeah, that's that's what totally interests me, is that they're lampooning another... Well, lampooning and considering, not necessarily in a strictly negative light, although perhaps just putting light on it and then it is negative all on its own, a, another ideology or movement. Right. I I am thoroughly interested in expanding the Bioshock lore, seeing what the rest of this crazy mad scientist steampunk world is like. Like, I cannot wait to see this. You do love your mad scientists. I do. I love my steampunk stuff, and I love alternate history stuff, which it really feels like Bioshock is just built on. No, I... Bioshock is all alternate history forever. I am totally down with everything this game is presenting to me, and the recent Beasts of America trailer is, you know, capped with an absolutely amazing song that goes with it. So yeah, I will totally be buying Bioshock uh, Infinite Day 1, which, if I'm looking correctly, uh, has just come up for pre-purchase on Steam. The visual style is a little different than I was expecting. It's, it's kind of bubbly. It looks... Like, kind of cartoony in a way that I like. It's kind of interesting. I was... I've mentioned earlier that I was always getting beyond Quantic Dream's upcoming game confused with Bioshock Infinite because there's the, um, out-of-her-depth psychic lady and the, uh, dude without special powers who's has a better grip on his mental health. But, um, the... 
the, when I first watched the Bioshock Infinite trailer, I was like, this doesn't look like Beyond at all. All these shapes are, like, curvy and kind of exaggerated. Yeah, the, the yeah. facial features on the main characters are definitely exaggerated. Likewise, the proportions of all of the characters in the game. But it's not unlike the the Bioshock characters. I mean, the Slicers weren't exactly the most physically accurate characters ever. But when you, like, look at the, the game's replacement for the Big Daddies, the Handyman and the Songbird are, uh, being the two that we've seen so far, they're disproportionately creepy and really cool looking at the same time. Right. Yeah, and the Bioshock's craziness is one of its greatest assets. So if the art style just you know, suggests that craziness as an added bonus that really plays together nicely with everything else. Right. The game's still not due out until uh, late February of next year, but I'm totally down for it. It's gonna be cool. Oh, yes. Uh, Likewise, we had the trailer for Iron Man 3 launch today. And that trailer is crazy. I, I was watching it, and my eyes were wide the whole time. Right? It, it looks it, like they're literally combining the plots of my favorite Iron Man comics into one film, which normally would be a horrible thing to say. But I'm kind of giving Marvel the, uh, the, the pass on this one because they haven't messed it up since they started doing this integrated universe push. It's hard to criticize Marvel Studios at this point. Right, like they've I, just been making I, great movie I after great movie. I genuinely think all of the Phase One movies that led to the Avengers were good films. Some were weaker than others, but they were all good. None of them were uh, Green Lantern. None of them even hit the lows of the Green Lantern film. Like I even I, 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 I gotta say I, didn't I think, think the, the Green w- Lantern film was bad. Like it was watchable. Yeah, it wasn't but spectacular. It, was, it didn't hold up to any of the recent just Marvel set movies. themselves on a different tier. Right, and I think that quality control is going to be behind all of the Marvel films going forward. Like I, I think the absolute worst of the Phase One movies was Thor. Yet that was still a really good movie. I really liked Thor. I might pick Thor over. Well, hmm. I mean, Captain America also could have been a really dull, boring film. I mean, let's face it, he's not the most interesting of the Avengers, but that film still managed to be really entertaining. I mean, none of those were as good as Iron Man 1 or 2, which, frankly, in my opinion, was the best of the Phase 1 movies. Yet they're all still good. Pixie was advancing a theory earlier, and I support this intensely. Based on the fact that Black the Widow totally rather? should have had a setup movie for the Avengers, because ah. my to, support for this is fair, based her, on the fact her that her setup Black movie Widow was kind was... of Iron Man Two. <laughs> right? Yeah, that was Black Widow was my favorite. But she part was of a Iron secondary Man. character. Right? She was not the main. She was character a secondary that character Ooh. that completely caused the plot to happen yeah. and resolve. You know, she was a necessary part of that movie. But yeah, I hear what you're saying. I would love a Black Widow and Hawkeye spin-off movie. Yeah, Hawkeye too. You could almost you could even combine those. You could put both of them in, into yeah, the same film. Yeah, you make one movie that's Hawkeye and Black Widow. Yeah, that would but, be well, interesting. but they, no, they've already we, flat out we said need that... To, but we, because we need to give the only female in the Avengers her own freaking movie. Why is it the but, women always get delegated to but support here, roles? Here's the problem with that. To do her own movie, it would have to be an origin story. You can't and? do the Black Widow's origin story because no one knows it. Well, why does it have to be an origin story? It, it would be the same it like as a- doing a Nick Fury origin story. And they've never done a full, accurate, yes, this is the hardcore set version in the current universe. Because the idea is that these characters are the mysterious, dark part of the universe. Actually, um... I think it was last May, uh, Johansson was actually a part of this Link Relevant. Um, oh god, we're going to Huffington where again? Where she's, where Scarlett Johansson herself has, you know, been a proponent for getting her that, uh, origin story movie. Right, well they'd have to lock it down, and that's a problem. The Black Widow movie I want to see is actually not an origin story, because... Well, largely, I'm not a fan of origin stories in comic movies, especially, well, I was going to say, especially for characters where everybody knows the origin stories, like uh, Superman or Spider-Man. You can just skip that part because, and get to the interesting stories immediately, and that would make a stronger movie. But even in general, 
uh, not having an origin story kind of makes characters intriguing, because you have to decode them and find out what makes them tick over the course of events happening. Oh, not yeah. just it being spoon-fed you like you're in a coma. That that idea that Loki was able to know parts of her past and hint at them made her a stronger character. Absolutely. Rather than just, um, yeah, flat I, out explaining it to the audience. I would like to point out that in uh, September of 2010, the producer for The Avengers, Kevin Feige, had come out and said that he, he had started discussions with Scarlet about the idea of a solo movie and putting together concept stuff. But they oh, yeah, wanted to do I, The Avengers first. I think each of these characters deserves a bigger story. I would like to know more about Hawkeye. I would really like to do another Hulk movie, which they haven't even mentioned the idea of that. Well, it's just, it's it's kind of bollocks that uh, the one female character that we have on the team doesn't get her own movie. She's always got to be a support to the men. I can't remember. Did the original Avengers have a female character? Wasp. Was she in the first set? Yes. I know she was in the Ultimates. I'm just wondering about the original. I Avengers am Kurt. all but all but 100 percent certain that she was in the original. But I'm doing some research right now. The Black Widow story yep. I want to hear told, and actually one of the reasons I want to see a Black Widow movie is that I feel like there's a great story just to be told, and that is the scene in the Avengers where she is being interrogated by the Russian mafia, but secretly she's just reverse interrogating them. Make that movie. Make a deep espionage spy flick. Make like a Bourne movie, or a, a Bond movie. Essentially, that, that would is... be the S.H.I.E.L.D. film, starring uh, the Black Widow. It, it She doesn't even have to be associated with S.H.I.E.L.D. You can be like her as a civilian spy. But that that's part I... of the problem with using her and Hawkeye as independent film characters. They are more closely tied to S.H.I.E.L.D. than any of the others. Well, you can include S.H.I.E.L.D., but I want a Black Widow movie with no supernatural elements. Hmm. I want a Black Widow movie that is just all humans, like, just technology that exists today. That It could just be a James Bond movie, and Black Widow is just cold manipulating just people. happens to be Casino Royale style. Right. Now, I'm, I'm looking at the original roster for the Avengers. Yep, so uh, she was a founding member of the Mighty Avengers. Ant-Man, Wasp, and Iron Man, and the Hulk. Yeah, I, I called Oh, and it. Thor. Totally called the it. The cap was added she, later. Also... She first appeared in a comic in 1963. Okay. knows yep. her comics. I have a feeling the Wasp they're waiting on for the inevitable Ant-Man movie. <laughs> I, That's a funny No, they've joke. already announced it. That one's coming. All right, now you've made me angry. They're, At first, I was just like, okay, I want this Black Widow movie because it would be cool. They're at, they greenlit an Ant-Man movie? Ant-Man is coming. <sighs> I was I surprised they actually there. didn't have a reference Ant -Man to Ant-Man is a terrible this. character. Oh, yeah, Ant-Man's, like, complete crap. Hank Pym is one of the worst characters in the Marvel Universe. Okay, well, as long as we're clear on that point. Yeah, I have no arguments. And not I'm... like he's a terrible person, but an interesting character. No, he's just a terrible character. Yeah, I, yep. I am frankly more interested in the Guardians of the Galaxy movie that they have announced. Because you know what? Rocket Raccoon on the big screen? Oh my god! Okay, that is appealing to me. I would go see a Guardians of the Galaxy movie. The one thing that I'm really hoping will come in in the next Avengers movie, I want to see Agent Coulson revived as the Vision. That needs to be in there. That would be pretty awesome. You can't let that character go. Although they have said when they start the uh, proposed Avengers TV show, Agent Coulson will be in it. Very cool. Besides, these movies wouldn't really be comic book movies if we don't just retcon deaths and resurrect people left and right anytime right. we feel like we, it. We saw his body dragged off. By no, me uh, by no stretch does that mean that we couldn't have revived him in some way later. I don't know. I, I, these movies are just going to continue to get crazier as this goes on, because as they just add character after character, like, I would love to see Power Girl added to the universe, because I think she is an amazing female character in the Marvel Universe. She is damn cool, all the way. She's, Power Girl is a great character. I would like to see somebody go over to Sony Sorry, Pictures. Sorry, Power Girl is DC. I'm thinking Miss Marvel. Does Miss Marvel have a chest window? No. Uh, let me double check. I know she's not wearing pants, but she does not, in fact, have a chest window. There, I found a picture of her. Uh, no. That's, this, is wearing... the second, this is the second time in ten minutes I've managed to call you on something in comics. It has been months since I actually bought a comic book. Gonna admit that. 
I don't even... Well, all of the comic book stores I used to go to in my town have gone out of business, as comic book stores are wont to do. And I don't even really know where to find any anymore. Like, I'm sure they're around, but... Oh, the person in town is that? still doing just fine. Yeah, we're just lousy with them, honestly. Right. Illinois comic book shops, we're doing fine. Um, no, I would love to see Miss Marvel added to the roster. I really hope they do Wasp and make her a strong character. I think she could be really cool. Um, trying to think what other Avengers. But can I'd we like get Wasp see. without getting Hank Pym? Because no, unfortunately, I think the two come together. <laughs> uh, package deal, codependent. Ugh. Yeah, you're I'm just having flashbacks of reading the Ultimates, film. aren't you? Featuring somebody going over to Sony Pictures and grabbing executives by their collars and punching them in the face until they relinquish the Spider-Man and X-Men and uh, Fantastic Four licenses. I, I want the Fantastic Four in this new Marvel universe. I really do. I so want to see Reed Richards interacting with the Avengers. I'm wondering who they would get to play Johnny, or would they just go for the ultimate awkwardness of making Chris Evans continue to do it? That would be really cool. Yeah, just have Chris Evans play two characters in one movie. And just, like, if they, they're they in shots together, just, you know, CG it. I don't care. Work exceptionally hard for this. Get Mary-Kate and Ashley. Okay, this is actually rather entertaining. There is an updated list on Wikipedia of current Avengers. Oh, Wikipedia, you have all information ever readily available. Honestly, it's kind of funny. Let's break down exactly what comics this Iron Man 3 trailer seems to be referencing, because the villain is the Mandarin. Right, which is genuinely classic uh, Iron Man. Like, we haven't seen, we haven't seen a, the Mandarin in a while. Like, he's come up in, in recent plot lines, but like, none of the major ones. He's just kind of been like a background villain. And I am thinking, when I was watching this trailer, there seem to be references that the events of the Avengers movie have driven Tony Stark into a bit of a depression, and perhaps he has turned to the bottle. Yep. We're, we're going to Demon in the Bottle. Uh, Stony Tark... Uh, Stony Tark. Tony Stark seems to be sick of his uh, celebrity from New York and, like, is experiencing nightmares. Which, you know, a giant battle that nearly destroyed an entire city would probably do that to you. You know, dying in at the ass end of the galaxy... That tends to have an effect on people. Yeah, being revived by a Hulk scream also would cause Nobody nightmares, me, right? I would imagine. Right? <laughs> also, eating shawarma I've heard is a nightmare for one's digestive tract. I'm not even gonna touch that. Probably a bad idea. So yes, um, we also seem to be dipping into extremist territory, as we do have uh, the named character from Extremist. I can't remember the female character's name, the lead scientist. Uh, Maya Henson has been named in the credits of this film, and is actually shown in the trailer. Uh, so she is a main part of the extremist storyline, which would lead to Tony Stark upgrading himself at the genetic level. Be able to better integrate with his armor, have better reaction times. Mm -hmm. Must be faster, stronger. Well, literally become part of the suit. I don't know. It, so, the it, trailer is pretty awesome. Go watch it. It looks like it's going to be a pretty amazing movie overall. Like, I really can't wait to see it. Apple has had an iPad event over the last week. They announced the long-expected iPad Mini, which is actually slightly smaller than all of the rumors were saying it was. It is 7.9 inches instead of being like 8.7 inches, which makes some sense because at least it is kind of different from the 10-inch iPad. If it was much larger than it is, then it'd be like... This is a slightly smaller iPad. It is, unfortunately, not as cheap as I was hoping. It is $329, which it is in the form factor competing against the Kindle Fire HD at 200 and the Nexus 7 at 200 And your $130 premium gets you a 1024 by 768 pixel screen, which, at an 8-inch diagonal, translates to 163 pixels per inch which is just about half of what Apple has always been claiming is the resolution at which you cannot see the pixels at arm's length. They're, quote, retina displays. The other obvious thing they did with the iPad Mini is that it has the new lightning connector at the bottom, so that if you're buying new accessories for your iPhone 5, they will be cross-compatible with your iPad Mini. And 
30 pin is no more. The thing that I was not expecting them to do at this event is that they actually revised the 10-inch iPad as well. The previous iPad, which was called, quote, the new iPad, but is now the old iPad, and I must say, how did nobody think about this when they were naming the new iPad, the new iPad? They have continued the trend of naming them stupid names, and the fourth generation iPad is named the iPad with Retina Display. And the thing that blows my mind about this, and I'm not going to criticize pixel density, because I'm a fan of pixel density, the iPad with Retina Display has the same display as the new iPad. They didn't improve the display. It's the same one. And yet now it's part of the name? Isn't the old iPad the iPad with Retina Display if it has the same one? This, this is crazy. But so, Apple. the iPad with Retina Display has just about all of the same specs as the third generation, except for that it has a lightning port instead of a 30-pin port at the bottom. So, if you have old accessories, then you can get a third generation iPad with about the same specs for slightly cheaper at the moment. They're selling uh, refurbished models for $370, but they're not manufacturing the old version anymore, so 30-pin accessories are truly deprecated. You cannot buy new devices that have 30-pin ports on them at all anymore. Make Apple stop. No more devices. Get- I like uh, more, give devices, me more devices. And I'm not... Apple's biggest fan because they tend to be fairly anti-consumer with respect to allowing people to install custom software on their devices. Don't forget Uh, all the the proprietary external stuff. Right. The thing that particularly gets my goat is that if I am a developer, I cannot make an app and then send it to my friend and they can use the software I made without paying Apple $100 a year and distributing it through their app store. There is no other way to distribute apps. And so, I feel like that kind of stifles innovation quite a bit, because if you're just a basement-dweller developer who wants to send something to your friend, that is not an option anymore like it was in the PC days. Um, but the other, the thing that I have really liked about Apple is that they have been a proponent for pixel density. The retina display was their idea, and nobody was really trying to push the envelope in that regard until Apple did it on the iPhone 4. And then, of course, immediately every Android device in the world followed suit, and now you can get a 300 DPI, and even in the case of the Butterfly J, which I tried to talk about last week despite some technical issues, a ridiculous 500 DPI. So, Apple has been really good about that, and that is why I'm disappointed that the iPad Mini has such a low-resolution screen. 163? That is way less than 300. It is technically the same resolution as the iPad 2, and it is smaller than the iPad 2, so that makes the individual pixels smaller, but I have a friend who has an iPad 2, and I have read a few books on it, and I must say, it is not a great screen for reading books on. The letters are all jaggy instead of being super smooth like they are on paper. Pixie. I hear you've been studying for the upcoming Windows 8 release. Indeed. I'm kind of still doing that, actually. Because I'm looking to get certified through Microsoft for that. Um, Just been going through demos and stuff, playing around with all the stuff that's going to come out with Windows 8. And honestly, okay, um, the best thing about it is also kind of the worst thing about it. In that this is totally designed to work with a touch screen, like, seamlessly. Like, all of the gestures and stuff, totally intuitive. Love them. Uh, and it's going to be the, the same OS across their, you know, Windows phones and their tablets and their little tablet-laptop hybrids. But, you know, for me using a desktop and a monitor, eh, not so much. But you can, you know, fire up the desktop app and basically get it to run like it is Windows 7. Um, so that's not a huge deal. What's interesting is the thing I just kind of glossed over in that last sentence all the shiny new hardware that's going to be coming out with it. There are a couple of different Windows 8 devices. There is a Lenovo device. Lenovo's got a couple tablets coming out, and so does Acer, and so does Asus. So. And are those, like, mostly ones where you can flip the screen around? Because the Lenovo I'm looking at is like the Dell 
uh, Inspiron Duo laptop where it's a laptop, but then the screen swivels and you fold it down on the keyboard and the screen's facing out instead of in. And it's I think tablet. so. I think I think a lot of those are dedicated tablets, strictly speaking. But um, okay, no keyboards at all. I, I'm having trouble remembering off the top of my head anyway. The other one that has been in advertisements a lot lately is the Microsoft Surface first-party tablets. And these are going to come in two varieties. There is the basic Surface tablets, which run actually Windows RT, which is which kind is the, of Windows 8. But it's a dumbed-down Windows 8. Now, it's going to come with um, Microsoft Office Home and Student but it's going to come with a different version that's not going to have all of the features, and there's going to be some stuff that it just won't be able to do because it just doesn't have the power to handle it. It's, uh -huh. it's as I said, a dumbed-down version of the operating system. The technical trick here is that the Windows RT versions run on ARM processors, which is the architecture that runs on your phone and that is fundamentally incompatible with the run that runs on your desktop computer at the moment which is x86. And so, while it looks like they have the same interface between them, and in terms of the Metro stuff, even though we're not technically supposed to call it Metro anymore because trademark lawsuits, we, we're still going to call it Metro forever, the Metro stuff is actually portable between x86 and ARM processors to a much greater degree than the old Windows interface stuff. The desktop environment in Windows RT for the basic Surface tablets does not run most desktop software. In fact, the only old Windows environment software that it runs is their fake version of Microsoft Office, which is probably kind of decent, but understand that the reason it runs Microsoft Office is because they basically made Microsoft Office again from scratch in order to run on these mobile processors. Yeah, no, those RT units are basic. They basically do what you like your smartphones and your tablets do now. <laughs> it's, they um, are the same type of processors, and those processors are objectively better. They're not necessarily as fast as high-end x86 processors right now, but they are way more energy efficient. So if you're running on a battery, it basically only makes sense to be using ARM processors if you can get the software for them. However, you know, if you actually need to do stuff, like, and be productive, or play games or something, yeah, no, not so much. No, especially because all software that has ever been written, essentially, is for x86 at the moment. It's Android and iOS apps that are mainstream ARM software at this point. But anyway, the, the point I was trying to make earlier is that what's interesting is all this hardware coming out, because you've got, basically, laptops that are being made, and... Um, matters that are being made with touch screens built into them now, specifically so that they can work using the touch controls on Windows 8. Now, you can, on your desktop unit or whatever, um, use mouse controls, and it'll work just fine, but it, it still kind of feels like it was meant for you to be using the gestures. You don't have to aim very precisely with the mouse, because the targets you're going to be clicking on are going to be these big, huge boxes that you could easily poke with your fat fingers if you were poking at them. Though, to be fair, you could resize the boxes. They're called tiles. Anyway, one of the really cool things that I'm looking forward to a lot about Windows 8 is the um, live tiles, which basically, you, you pin tiles to your desktop, and they basically kind of work like apps. And these live tiles work like how, say, you've got Facebook on your home screen on your uh, given smartphone and you've got your phone sending you push notifications. You can basically get those push notifications on your desktop via Windows 8 and these live tiles. Those live tiles mean that they're coming up with new information as it comes in. And you can, like, have a couple different ones of those pins up at the same time, so you can have, like, your little chat windows or whatever, all your messenger stuff up on one side of the screen while you're working in Office on the other. And it's, it's just basically for those of us who, like, do crap tons of multitasking and background stuff. I, I just, I'm really super psyched about it. Well, that's all pretty sweet. The marketing campaign for Windows Phone 8, which contained the, or Windows Phone 7 even, which contained the same design paradigm, is glanceable information. Their slogan was, get in, get out, get on with your life. Ho! 
Yes. Well, I didn't even realize how dirty that was. <laughs> mm. I feel like buying a Windows Phone 7 now all of a sudden. But the idea is that they just put information in front of you such that you don't have to go look at it. It's just already there. Mm -hmm. And you can glance at it as you're on your way past to do something else and absorb it. Uh, they've also, like, kind of simplified. It's like they've basically broken it down into, you're doing basically four different things. They're calling these things charms, and they're going to be set up on the right side. So either you're going to, like, tap or click or whatever on the right side of your screen. And you've got basically, um, was it search, share, um, settings, and then there's one other one that I'm not thinking of right at the moment. But, um, and so it's search, you're going to search everything that's on, like, your computer and, you know, your SkyDrive and stuff like that. Um, share is, you know, just, you could, you know, send this picture, send this, you know, news article, send whatever it is you're looking, you happen to be looking at, and send that via a whole bunch of different means, email, Facebook, whatever. And so it's, they've, they've consolidated all of these things into, like, basically just four steps. Efficient. Like, super simple, yeah. So, there's this, um, Surface commercial that Microsoft this. has been running in a it was, lot of places. It was places. Start. The other but okay, it was Search, Share, Start, which gets you basically back to your home screen. Uh, devices, which is, you know, your printers and basically anything anything that you plug in is actually just supposed to work, and, like, it'll just fetch the drivers and all that on its own. And interestingly, those four almost sound like the uh, um, standard Android capacitive buttons. They're not quite. The Search and Home are obviously exactly the same. And then, what was it, share and... It's search, share, start, um, devices and settings, basically. Which, among other things, you use to, like, you know, personalize your background pictures and change colors and stuff and change the size of icons, mm -hmm. things like that. Woo. It all just kind of seems like uh, this is taking some cues from the smartphone world. The things we've learned about design over the past five or so years. There is a commercial that Microsoft has been running in just about everywhere for the Microsoft Surface tablets that consists of no information about the tablets themselves, but a extensively choreographed dance routine with lots of clicking. And the, the one thing that interested me about it in passing is the very mainstream morning radio friendly dubstep that for I briefly thought was was nastier than it actually was. And I had to get second opinions from my co-hosts, and they informed me that it was not actually very substantial. But there is... It is interesting that Microsoft would choose to market the Surface with no technical information, but rather some dancing and some Just light some dubstep. mainstream dubstep. Yeah. It's, like the, it's like the dubstep your mom listens to to pretend that she's cool. Because we're hard. The other thing that that commercial dubsteps. reminded me of is, like, they're trying to rip off the OK Go music video with the treadmills. It's just like this dance routine where they're throwing all of these Surface tablets around for no reason. Honestly, it's probably the same company that made both commercials. Hey, Sen. Yep. I want to play a new champion in League of Legends, not one of the old ones. Oh, great. When you're, do I get to do that again? Great, you're waiting until next week. <laughs> uh, due to Season 2's conclusion, they have not released a new champion in League of Legends since Kha'Zix, who was the last one added to the game. And this time around, they're going to be going into somewhat familiar territory. Uh, effectively, we have a hybrid champion, uh, similar to Jace, where the character starts with the alt already known and can use the alt in order to switch forms. Uh, the character is named Elise. She is the Spider Queen. And she is an AP mid who goes from a control CC character, uh, a mage, into a AP-based assassin spider when you trigger the alt. The uh, levels and of is the that really as soon as next week that we get to play her? Yep. Yeah, she's already been fully revealed. Uh, typically when a character has been revealed and they've done the uh, inside designer profile, they wait two or three days while they play the character on the public test environment and then go ahead and release her. In this case, we're waiting for the big new Twisted Tree Line remake patch, uh, the the Halloween, the, basically the Halloween content for the game. When that is released, we will have the new champ, uh, four new skins for the game, uh, the new summoner icons, which we can discuss if you'd like. 
The interesting thing about them is not anything about the icons themselves, because they're Halloween-themed, but they have the same general style as all of the existing summoner icons. Right. But how you acquire them. They're so, bonuses you get. Yeah, Riot has set up a system in which they are tiering the amount of IP that you have purchased. And based on those purchases, that determines what level you get to, and the level you get to determines which icon you receive, or which set of icons you receive. Uh, likewise, in addition to the Halloween, or the harrowing skins, we also have a new set of uh, skins coming out for uh, champs that are not going to go away, that will not be legacy skins. Uh, those skins are this year's Pirate Rise, Zombie Brand, and Headmistress Fiora, which... As much as I'm usually against the fetishized costumes, which I put that in air quotes for some reason, not quite sure, because none of you could see it. The idea of Fiora beating someone with a ruler is hilarious. That actually does sound interesting, but I want her to be a nun then, instead of a teacher. Nope, she she is headmistress. She's not even a teacher. She is wearing a very smart uh, business dress with... I admitted quite a bit of exposed cleavage, but uh, it's not as terrible as, say, like, the vein art. I I'll go ahead and link this in chat right now. One moment, though. What are you gonna there. do, Sen, when we go live? Uh, just censor myself in general. <laughs> I don't blame him, because I don't want to be live ever, either. Admit it, if that's my only one this show, I'll consider it a, a, a boon. So, yeah, Zombie like... Zombie brand. Okay, that looks Zombie like... brand looks funny. He looks like Mr. Freeze to me for some reason. And for some reason, Brand is now wearing a tie. <laughs> I guess I guess it's because Brand has his Batman Mr. Freeze skin. Right. It's like, I still get that vibe from the zombie version. Admitted, Pirate Rise looks nothing like normal Rise. Like, I'm really Pirate hoping... Rise I'm, is basically just gangplank. I am praying there is an animation gun. where for, like, Riot, uh, Rise's Q, he actually pulls the cannon from his back and fires it. I want to see Pirate Rise and Gangplank planning together, even though it makes no sense. Considering we now have, like, five pirate skins in the game? Yeah, we do, actually, because I think... And actually, they're all in the those art... Two. They're all in the art here. Um, hey, you've Katarina, got those two. You've got, Fiddle, um, Rumble, Fortune. Tristana, and Swain all have pirate skins. And For Fortune. Fortune's a pirate in general. Exactly. Fortune didn't need a skin to be a pirate. She's got the one that she's, you know, wearing by default. So if we if we follow this trend out far enough, what needs to happen is we could have a real pirates versus poser pirates match. You know what? And it'd be people who are real pirates versus people who only pretend to be pirates sometimes. No, I want to see a theme attached to the headmaster uh, slash headmistress concept. I want, like, who else would you headmaster that to? Zillion, Fiora. Okay. Like, Zillion makes sense. Victor? Let's do Zillion, Fiora... Um, I'm trying to think what other female characters would work for this. Uh, Vane. Zillion's a dude. <laughs> right. It, even funnier that way. Okay. I mean, you could do Headmaster Zillion. But no, just the idea that we replaced Fiora's uh, fencing sword with a ruler is funny to me. I, I'm hoping they is change a pretty funny the weapon. sound of when it hits someone. That would be great. No, I'm all for this costume. I think this is a great Halloween costume. She does have a pretty rad scarf. Right? I'd wear that scarf. It's a huge scarf. It's like ten feet long. Well, they had to do something, because the normal Fiora skin has a giant cape. Ah. Likewise, they've... have cloth effects for the people on high graphic settings. They've also added the skins for wards, which you purchase for an amount of time. That seems kind of gross. Um, I guess that yeah. gives them the opportunity to stop offering them if they decide they don't like their... If they don't want them to be available anymore. Right. Um, the wards do come with their own special placement, idol, and death animations, which is kind of neat. Do you know how long you have them attached to your account when you buy them? Um, well, according to the picture I am currently looking at, uh, one week is... There are two of them that are purchased with RP only, and two of them that are purchased with IP only. Um, the RP ones are 25 points for one week. The IP ones are 200 for one week. Okay. Well, I was going to say that it is 
kind of unsettling to be spending real money on a temporary vanity item. But people do but, this anyway on the uh, the boosts. Right, but I mean, nominally, the boosts are accrue permanent benefits. The XP, if you buy an XP boost, then your character level stays forever, right. even though the boost expires. And if you purchase an IP boost, then your IP doesn't expire, just the boost. Mm-hmm. Well, Whereas with the ward skins, everything goes away. I... I do like the idea of some of these things that they're adding. Um, like, I, I like the idea of skin uh, skins for wards. I don't like the, the idea of them being temporary. The thing that interests me about it, though, is that I have the 450 IP they gave as the Christmas bonus for last year, and there's nothing you could spend exactly 450 IP on. RP. So since these ward skins are so cheap... I can blow this IP that I can't spend RP. on anything else, or RP rather, that I can't spend on anything else. Right. On well, ward you could skins. get a cheap skin that was on sale. I I, I actually only have 160 left. Ah. I bought something. I don't well, even know go. what. Oh, I I do like that. Riot took a vote on what to do with the new skins that were coming out. So the harrowing skins, uh, Fiora, Brand, and Rise are going to become legacy skins on November 14th. They're just going to go away. You can't acquire them after that point. But the Shadow Isle skins, uh, Hecarim, Maokai, and Twisted Fate, are going to be permanently in the store. And fans voted for that. Hooray for democracy, I guess. I I respect Riot for these decisions. That and probably the biggest announcement coming out of this patch, the complete rework of Twisted Treeline, as well as bot support for Twisted Treeline. Oh, I like more bots any way I can get So them. if you just want to play 3v3 versus the bots on Twisted Treeline, by all means, do it. Did I get the impression earlier that they were renaming the map? Uh, with the Shadow Isles? Yeah. The Shadow Isles is the name of the initiative that they're pushing right now. I, Twisted Treeline's still going to be called Twisted Treeline. Okay. It will have a new skin that reflects the Shadow Isles. And it seems that there's going to be a beta version available in the next uh, patch with some balance changes, yep, including the non-randomized jungle mobs. I I am kind of sad that Rengar is getting nerfed yet again. My preferred champ of choice right now. I, I can honestly say, though, that I agree with Riot's decision. Rengar is pretty powerful. Right, he's taking a hit to the uh, cooldown on his ultimate, and he's having his the power on his empowered Q reduced from 250% of his damage to... 200% of his damage. So, not that big a deal. Pretty sure I can still one-shot those uh, mid-lane squishies when I jump on them. Yeah, just more efforts to tweak the game. That said, the finals that they had two weeks ago did reveal a lot of information on characters that need to be tweaked, who are definitely too strong in the current meta. Uh, amongst the top list, Blitzcrank and Sona, the preferred... Uh, the preferred supports are definitely in line in a post from uh, Morello made earlier this week. It'll be good to be adding new champions again all the time so that it is hard to determine how unbalanced the current meta is because everybody's always playing the new thing. Nope, Rengar's still the best. Sorry. So yeah, that's a thing. Uh, we're, we're in discussions right now as to whether we want to do a like full League of Legends podcast every other week. And I think it'd be a fine idea, because it seems like content is lacking in that department. There could be merit in that idea. My only concern is, how do you find the time to record things? Well, we could um, just make one of these dedicated to League of Legends every other week, is what he's saying? If you guys want to broadcast it on the air, I do not mind. It's an idea we will consider in the future. Right. You two will both need to play more League of Legends, if that's going to be a thing. Indeed. We'll do our best. Believe us, it's not for lack of wanting to play League of Legends. It's more, there's no opportunities. Well, it's part of the problem with League of Legends, as we've said this, I think, many times before, is that League of Legends, each individual game is a huge time investment. It's like, sure, oh, I'd yeah. like to play a game of League of Legends, but I don't have an extra hour of continuous time to give. Right. It's a huge and uncertain time investment, because, you know, sometimes it might just be 20, 25 minutes. Sometimes it might be 70 minutes. You never know. I have know. had a game go for an hour and a half. It was rather ridiculous. Have you ever played any Dominion? Oh yeah, I love Dominion. 
guaranteed between... Do I get the impression that that is time limited? Yep, because the uh, there is a constant tick down of your Nexus's health. So the longest game of Dominion is 25 minutes. I suppose I ought to try that format sometime then. Oh no, it's really enjoyable. I, I enjoy playing Dominions. I, I know a couple players who uh, exclusively play it. Uh, one week ahead of the release of Assassin's Creed 3, Steam is having a pretty steep sale on Assassin's Creed games that, if you're hearing this on WLRA, will be going on until 6pm Central Time this afternoon. You can get the two good games, 2 and Brotherhood, for $5 each, $10 total. And there's a big package that's like 38 bucks, but don't buy that. All you need is 2 and Brotherhood. And the other interesting news... Um, that is heading up Assassin's Creed is that the Ubisoft internal motion picture department has announced that Michael Fassbender is attached as the lead role of an Assassin's Creed movie. Great. That is Michael, Michael Fassbender, Fassbender as, as Desmond. Magneto from X-Men First Class as Ezio. I don't know. I figured he'd be playing uh, Desmond because Desmond's so the main character. Oh, yes, definitely. The interesting one that everybody cares about. Right. Oh, man. No, uh, for next week, I really would love to find the time and money to play XCOM. I have. I really want to play XCOM, things. too. It has been dominating the gaming scene. Everybody yeah. loves it. I, I want to play it so bad, but I don't know if I can find time with the Journeyman League that we just started, plus the largest War Machine tournament of the year being two weeks away. Just in terms of doing my homework and... Not very much else. I very nearly put my car in park at a traffic signal earlier today and fell asleep in the driver's seat on a main road in my town. That's going to be me in so, November. <laughs> should add XCOM into that mix and see how that works out. Uh, probably not well. So yeah, this has been a thing. Alright, so in the next hour, we're probably going to continue plugging To Kill a DJ because we have fabulous prizes coming up in our upcoming raffle drawing, and you need to buy some tickets and help so the families of some sick children. Um, our show will be Thursday, November... Was it 15th? Yes. Thursday, November 15th from 6 a.m. to noon. Uh, we'll also post a recorded version after the fact, but the important thing is that you really, really must pick up some raffle tickets. They're $3 each or two for five off of me. Um, you can shoot us a message on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash nerdtalk, or um, you can tweet me at nerdtalkpixie, or... Uh, stop by the studio even while we're there. <laughs> Honestly, uh, yes, open choice. Last um, week we promised hard information about what some of the prizes might be, and we've put together an amazing prize pool. And you are welcome, guys. Because There I've... is, amongst other things, a copy of Beyond Good and Evil for the PC. So I've got Steam Keys for... We've got Steam Key for Torchlight 2. We've got a Steam Key for Beyond Good and Evil. I just picked up Steam Keys for those two Assassin's Creed games that you mentioned. There are Blu-rays, a special edition Blu-ray of The Avengers, great movie, that you can win. Um, there will also be a uh, paperback copy of Ben Yahtzee Croshaw's first book, Mogworld, so that will be exciting. And we'll probably have some other stuff, too. <laughs> <laughs> that is just a taste of all of the amazing winnings you can have by supporting these ch children and killing these DJs. Four serious guys, three dollars, and you can help some kids out, and it will be great. Anyway, so in the next hour, I'm sure Pyro and I will have more to go into um, as we draw closer to the weekend. Uh, Sen, you got anything else before we kick you off the show? I have nothing. Get out. Bye. All right, in the meantime, I'm Pixie. I am Sen. I thought you were supposed to get out. I'm Pyro Sim. <laughs> and we'll see you in just a few minutes at the top of the hour on Nerd Talk. So it turns out I lied about that top of the hour part. I'm Pixie. Hey, I'm Pyrosim. And you just heard us say that, but I guess we felt it bore repeating. Well, maybe you forgot who we were over the course of that little transition music. It's understandable. My memory isn't very good either. What is radio? How do... <laughs> How you mind for fish. How you mind for fish. Anyway... So, I guess we should delve into some news and updates about some things that we talked about in the last hour. Um, the main thing is that, holy crap, guys, Windows 8 comes out tomorrow. 
Tomorrow. That's really soon. Indeed. So, are you going to have it on launch day, Pixie? Uh, I hope to. Um, I've got my submission to Microsoft for the upgrade from Windows 7. So, fingers crossed, because we picked up uh, my desktop rig fairly recently. It was just the summer. So, we'll see how that goes. Microsoft has a program where if you bought an OEM PC bundled with Windows 7 after June 9th, I believe, at least early June, you can upgrade to Windows 8 for $15. $15 is not a lot of money. And if you're not eligible for that program, it is only $69, which is way cheaper than Windows has ever been in the past. I don't think I'm going to necessarily upgrade launch day, even though I'd love to, uh, because... Shiny new the, stuff. It was between June... It was, it was um, if you bought a Windows 7 PC, um, June 2nd or June 2nd. later. Um, and that's continuing it through January 31st of next year. Well, they give you a pretty big window there. Nice of yep. Microsoft to extend some goodwill to its customers. The reason I'm not going to pick it up immediately is that I also built a PC pretty recently, but it wasn't an OEM, so I don't, I'm not eligible for that program. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is that I have just the slightest bit of resilience. Dude, that's Windows 8 Pro. For Listen, the reason that... That upgrade offer is for Windows 8 Pro. Nice. That's really generous. I am unclear Which on... Which means that it comes with Media Center versions. and lets you do In networking the... stuff, but... So, w w what are the alternative versions, do you know? Um, well, you've got Windows RT, which only comes on, like, those little tablet things. Um, you've got Windows 8 um, and Windows 8 Pro, which, as far as I'm aware, the only distinction, really, between Windows 8 and Windows 8 Pro is that um, Pro includes, um, what you call it, the Media Center and... Um, lets you do like basically advanced networking stuff, which we kind of might want for you know show related shenanigans anyway. Right. I in previous generations of Windows, there have always been like a lot of versions. Windows Seven came in fully like uh, twelve flavors. There is Ultimate, and then there's Home Basic, and then there's Home Premium, and then there's Pro Basic, and then there's Pro Premium. I, I apparently missed one. Now they've consolidated it substantially, and I'm pleased to hear that because it was stupid how many versions there were before. So, and yeah, um, I, was, I was mostly right. Um, Windows 8 Pro does, you know, things, you, you know, your advanced networking shenanigans, encrypting stuff, and... Um, includes the Windows Media Center that's only going to be available in Pro. And then there's another version up above that, uh, which is Windows 8 Enterprise, which is everything in Pro, and then some more stuff. Um, but that's even, like, more business IT slanted. So your average user will be okay with Windows 8, but um, for us, I think we're, you know, going to want Pro. Yeah, I tend to take advantage of one or two of the crazier features of Windows that aren't available in at least Windows 7 Home Basic, such as the remote desktop connections feature, which, if you've never used this, it is kind of mind-blowing to find out that it exists, but there's basically a protocol built into Windows where you can just log into another computer over a network, and it controls it just like you were local. And obviously that software exists commercially. There's um, a Log Me In products and Citrix remote desktop. But just native Windows remote desktop protocol is really good. And that is unfortunately one of the things that was locked behind the more expensive versions of Windows previously. That I think more people will have access to now that Pro is $69 instead of 200 um, and Windows Media Center itself is not a bad piece of software. If you're going to be using your computer hooked up to a big TV, if you're going to put it in your living room, Windows Media Center is probably the software to use. Uh, it's got – it looks actually a lot like Steam Big Picture if you've used that but not Windows Media Center. 
And I don't know if you can control it with an Xbox controller. I actually have had two PCs that have come bundled with Min Windows Media Center Edition, and they came with um, infrared remote controls that look like TV remotes that you control them with uh, via the paradigm up, down, left, right, just like you would an analog stick. I got to think that you would be able to control it with an Xbox controller. But it's it's very pretty for putting on a big screen that you're going to sit 10, 15 feet away from. Uh, anyway, I was going to say that of the reason I have any resistance against the Shinies and buying in at full price on launch day is that I spent a fair amount of time with the release candidate, which was available for free prior to release. And so I, I at least have, I know what the Shinies are like. I can postpone them for a little bit. I don't know what I'm waiting for, probably a sale. Like I can get it for cheaper than 69 if I wait. And then the other side effect, of course, is that drivers will only become more stable the longer I wait. I am tolerant of crashes because I'm a power user. And so if my driver crashes, I know what happened. And I'm not just like a grandma who's like, oh, it doesn't work. How how uh, my world is falling apart. Just be like, oh, OK, well, I'll just deal with this. Um, But yeah, maybe I'll just buy in as soon as I get a chance to get to a Best Buy or something. I, the argument, I have talked myself out of waiting based on what do I gain by it. I don't know that it really will get cheaper. All right, I'm going to buy in launch day. Windows 8 is off. Woo! <laughs> well, it's, you know, you and I have to have the shiny new things. Shiny new things are amazing. You got to think that there's like hundreds or thousands of engineers, and these are amongst the human race some of the best of the best people, our best and brightest, who are working on improving this software that I spend literally 10, 15 hours a day using, just sitting in front of it and using this software constantly. And so. Thousands of our best and brightest are working on making that experience better for me. I want that. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm just looking forward to getting my hands on a shiny new toy that I can play with and, you know, all of the fun times of, you know, picking colors and backgrounds and redecorating that goes with that. I, I, Feel a little bit silly admitting to that, but there, you, there it is. Hey, I like picking backgrounds. And colors. I feel like I'm almost going to have a negative sensation of having Windows 8 and looking at Metro. And even though I, I feel like Metro is super usable with a mouse and keyboard, I just want to poke it. I feel like that, that is as as I said in the LCD in the monitor on my desk. In the last um segment I I had said um well not last segment, but in the last hour, I had mentioned that the best feature about Windows eight is the touch gestures. The worst thing about Windows eight is the touch gestures because well, you want to use them and then it's like nope. But it, I mean I'll know more once I get my hands on it, but they've they've got it set so that you can run it like a regular desktop and that you know you can use all of the stuff with the mouse and keyboard so it shouldn't be bad right and realistically as cool as metro is i'm not going to be going to metro internet explorer for my browser i'm still probably going to swap to the desktop interface and be using chrome and 99 percent of my computer time is looking at a full screen chrome window so Maybe I'll only be looking at Metro for a few minutes a day. Maybe the the siren call won't wound you so badly then. Yep. Maybe I won't be at risk of actually just sticking my finger into my non-touchscreen LCD monitor on my desk. And then feeling the crushing weight of your disappointment. Yep. So... I want to talk a little bit about the reason Metro is not called Metro anymore. Uh, TechCrunch sure, has a story it. about it, 
And they are acting like it's kind of mysterious. They say that Microsoft changed the name and nobody knows why. And the new official name is, quote, the new Windows user interface. Um, this is kind of disappointing from TechCrunch because I think the reason is fairly well documented. There was some other entity that was using the Metro name in Europe, and they had some trademarks on it. And Microsoft just got out of Dodge to avoid litigation. Um, and I am okay with you abandoning the Metro name if there was a trademark conflict. But my pro I want to protest to the fact that they did not give it a new name in replacement for that. Quote, the new Windows user interface is not a name. If you want us to stop calling it Metro, you have to give it a different name. Oh. People, why do companies not give things names? Why is the iPad 4 not named the iPad 4? It's crazy. All right, shall there we is a new thing that does have a name, though. The Samsung Galaxy Note 2, which just had a big unveiling event in New York at 7 p.m. Eastern Time last night. And I have to criticize TechCrunch again because... They had a post saying they were going to live blog it, and then I was like, I was desperate for coverage of this event because I was in a class at school during this event. But I was like, I, I need, I need a live blog. Somebody get me a live blog. The Verge, can you help me? Nope, they don't have anybody there. And Gadget, you got anything? Nope. Oh, this story saying that are going to live blog it, but they didn't. It's like, how dare you? And then your heart was broken, and, then, and you couldn't be friends with them anymore. Yep. But the follow-up stories showed that the information that they were looking for, which was a release date for Verizon, was actually not presented at the event, which makes me confused as to why the event existed, because the Galaxy Note 2 has been available overseas uh, in Korea and Europe for nearly a month now. And the versions that are coming to the United States on just about all carriers, there's a T-Mobile, a Sprint, an AT&T, and Verizon, and a U.S. cellular even. So, but there's no way that uh, the Galaxy Note 2 is not available to you if you have a reasonably large U.S. carrier. The, those versions are exactly the same as the overseas version, with the exception of the bundled software and the radios. So... It's not like there's enough to unveil to justify renting out a exhibition hall in New York and having a event, which maybe is why none of my tech sites covered it. But the one thing that they needed to do was announce a release date for Verizon, and they didn't even do that. They did, however, have a Verizon unit there for people to look at, and it turns out that the home button at the bottom of the screen has a big, fat Verizon logo on it, on the Verizon version. And it is so ugly. Like, this phone is available on every carrier in the entire world, and none of them decided that they needed to put a logo on the home button. But Verizon did. What a bunch of jerks. I was seriously considering purchasing the phone, and that has actually significantly turned me off because... I mean, one of the things that a phone is useful for, besides obviously all its great technical uses, is a status symbol. You show it off to people and they're like, ooh, this looks good. And But then if it has a big fat Verizon logo in the middle of it, I don't feel like it's as much a status symbol for me anymore. Not, I, I didn't really care that much about the status symbol element. I just feel like Verizon is grossly mishandling this product. It's like, I, I want to give you my money, but you're making it hard for me. This product has been available all around the world for more than a month, and and you just won't announce a release date, not even put it out. Just give me an announcement of when you're going to put it out, and they won't. Um, so the thing that I was really excited with about this device is it's – a big phone. It's the biggest phone that you could possibly put in your pocket. It's like 5.5 inch devices. Or what size like pockets do you have, you crazy man? I have pockets of male pants. 
it turns out that pants for men are made with pockets that can fit five and a half inch devices. Not oh. so much women's pockets. <laughs> oh, well, if I was making pockets for that, I'd need a seven inch device. I could get the Nexus 7 or the Kindle Fire HD. Oh. I cannot believe we just made that joke, but we did. So moving on. <laughs> The thing that really excited me about the Galaxy Note 2 is that it has a siloed pressure-sensitive stylus. And this is a thing that I've been wanting in phones forever. And so the thing about it being so big is it's just about the size of a Field Notes or a Moleskin notebook. So if you're the kind of person who already carries around a Field Notes or a Moleskin, this is a pretty good substitute because you pull out the stylus and it's pressure sensitive and it's it, this is the Wacom inductive technology so this is not like the really bad Ooh. experience that you'll get from a capacitive stylus have you ever used a capacitive stylus you know you must have I, at least I, I think we might have played with them at an NAB show actually um, two years ago yeah well, if you've seen them on store shelves, the thing that you'll tend to notice is that they don't come to points the way a pen or a pencil does. They come to, like, uh, semi-spherical yeah, the little balls. balls at the tip. And that's because capacitive uh, screens need to be touched over an area in order to sense things. But the stylus for the Galaxy Note 2 is a Wacom stylus stylus that uses the same technology that you'd use if you were using a Bamboo or an Intuos tablet on your desktop PC, or even a Cintiq. It's the same technology for all of them. And so it is precise, and it is pressure sensitive, and you can take notes with it. The Wacom like, guys were really cool when we met them at uh, the last NAB show we went to. They were super cool. Nice guy, big booth, lots of stuff to look at. We totally drew pictures and left them up on their big monitors that were hanging in the aisles. Left nerd talk propaganda. Yep. Just got to spread the gospel. We're actually uh, planning on making a return to NEB show um, this April. It will be very cool. If you happen to be attending the National Association of Broadcasters convention. Or just, you know, in the Las Vegas area. Fives are guaranteed. Or, you know, if you're in the Las Vegas area and you want to do a nerd talk meetup. That could probably be arranged. Absolutely. Uh, we have no idea yet if Sen is going to make it, but at least Pyrosim and I will. Yep. So I have a bit of a strange um, compulsion when it comes to paper notebooks, which is that I'm afraid of running out of pages. Like, I almost tend to not write things down in paper notebooks because... You're using up a finite resource, and you can maybe try and erase it if you're using a pencil, although pencils are not as good as pens. And the if you do erase it with a pencil, then it's still going to leave residue on the page. And so one of the things about the Galaxy Note is that it's digital. And so you just make a page, and you scribble on it, and uh, whatever. There's infinitely more pages and you can erase, and the erasure is perfect, and it leaves no residue. And you have undo buttons. You can undo and redo. My sister, who is a fairly talented artist, has often expressed the idea that the only thing that uh, drawing on conventional media is missing is the Control-Z button. Because it's like, yeah, I can, I can paint, and I can use colored pencils, and that's all great. But there's no Control-Z button. And it's just so terrible. Another alternative, which Pixie is proposing to me to the Galaxy Note for fixing my finite notebook resource woes, is the Staples Arc Notebook. Which this product is actually so cool, I feel like we should cover it a little bit. Uh, what do you want to know about it, really? I mean, I don't want to turn this into a commercial thing. It's It's got... Well, the idea is that you can put new pages in it and take old pages out of it. And it's got a whole bunch of different types of pages and like accessories like pockets so you can store things other than just pencil markings in your notebook. It is, it is a... Since Verizon has made it so difficult to get my digital notebook on, I think I'm going to replace it with 
a conventional notebook where I can add and remove pages. Uh, well, that fixes my problem for much cheaper. My um, I I, I gotta confess that about ninety percent, uh, even as much as ninety seven percent of the use of my notebook is doodling. Like, there's planner pages in there where I conceivably use it to write homework things in it and take notes in lecture, but I'd wager most of it's just doodling. That is the other thing that really strikes me as cool about the ARC notebook. Cosplay in stuff. In my backpack right now, I have a, quote, drawing notebook, which has unlined paper, and a school notebook, which has lined paper in it. It's like, I just want to carry around one notebook that has both lined and unlined paper available for whatever I need to do. And ARC pages, it turns out, you can do that, and you can even have crazier pages, like they have laboratory report-style ones with annotations on the side and anything you need. And then I think I'm going to blow your mind, because the, they make an ARC-style um, hole punch, and then you can take regular paper of whatever variety and then make it so that it fits in the style of the ARC notebook. Whoa! Actually, come to think of it, if there's that, then you could be really crazy and put the micro dot live scribe paper in an ARC notebook and use it with a live scribe pen. I was thinking you could put like sketchbook person. paper in there, but okay. You totally could. The options are endless. What you could not put in an ARC notebook is... The new polling stuff on the Xbox dashboard. That is the most awkward segue you have ever done on this show, and that is saying something. <laughs> I like segues awkward sometimes. They're like puns. I feel like a bad pun is better than a good pun sometimes. In moderation. I like me a bad segue here or there. I, I, I had only mentioned this and like people are getting up in arms over the content of the polls. I have no interest in that covering that because this is not a political show. Um, <laughs> watch me not care. I'm more interested in this on the technical aspect and that the ooh, this is kind of neat. And that apparently, and I think I covered this before when the presidential debates were first starting, is that if you watched all like at least three of the debates um, on your Xbox 360, you got like exclusive armor for your um, Xbox Live avatar. Yeah, that was neat. I have not managed to watch a single one on my Xbox, however, because I've always not been at home, which is kind of sad. But um, anyway, so this thing I was noticing that um, they've been doing, which I hadn't had a chance to see prior to today, is that apparently um, if you're watching the debates on Xbox Live, they do live polling that you can like vote on like certain issues with using the directional pad on your gamepad. Like, yes, no, not sure on particular issues, like how you feel about, I don't know, drone strikes or whatever. And I, I just thought it was a cool feature that, you know, engages you instead of just, you know, passively watching things or putting them on in the background. It's, I, I, I am just so into the idea of active engagement in content, um, participation rather than consumption. Absolutely. Like that is something that I really value as well. Then it is also nice that this is kind of meaningful stuff. It's, I compared it initially to the Everybody Votes channel on the Wii, and Pixie's response was that, yes, it's like that, but not stupid and meaningless. Well, because, you know, presumably these things are, the, the content of these polls are slightly more important than what you had for breakfast or what your favorite color is. Yep. I also can only imagine that the user experience will be better than the Everybody Votes channel on the Wii. At the very least, this it looks pretty. Prettier. Mm -hmm. uh, let's and see. We're... Let's be realistic. You're going to be using an Xbox. Nobody's using their Wii. Ah, <laughs> oh, snap. Um, at any rate, we're kind of running up against the clock here. So I wanted to knock out one one last pitch for. Um, actually, what are we doing next week? Um, I have no idea. <laughs> we'll have to wing that one. We uh, next week we'll do something. Uh, <laughs> uh, I wanted to get one last pitch out here for To Kill a DJ, the biannual charity here at WLRA eighty eight point one FM, the Start, um, where we raise funds for Advocate Hope Children's Hospital Family Assistance Fund. Um, 
So all the proceeds raised from that um, directly benefit the families of the kids who are hospitalized there who, you know, need money for things like prescriptions, transportation, food, um, important stuff. It's not going to, you know, be buying the hospital, you know, any new wings, but it's, it, it goes directly to the families, which I think is kind of nice because hospitals tend to get, you know, sponsorships from people with much fatter wallets than, you know, the everyday family will. Right. And so the, the, it's a really great cause. Um, we do this, like I said, twice a year. Um, this is our fall 2012 iteration. Uh, I'm doing a, um, they're talks doing a raffle where we're giving away some awesome prizes. Um, the tickets are they're cheap at three bucks each or two for five. You can send me an email to pixie at nerdtalkshow.com. That's P-I-X-I-E at N-E-R-D-T-A-L-K-S-H-O-W.com. Um, you can like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash nerd talk. Send us a message there if you're interested uh, or tweet me at nerd talk pixie. Uh, some of the prizes that we will be giving away in this raffle include um, Steam Keys for Torchlight 2, uh, Beyond Good and Evil, and let's see, two Assassin's Creed games, which are Assassin's Creed 2 Deluxe Edition and Assassin's Creed Brotherhood. There will also be an Avengers Blu-ray DVD. Um, all kinds of fabulous prizes. We're going to try and give away like one prize every hour at the very least on Thursday, November 15th from 6 a.m. to noon. And of course, if you want to catch the show after the fact, we'll have recordings posted on our website at nerdtalkshow.com. <laughs> well, boy, that was a lot to spit out at once. Pyro, you got anything? Yep. Just everything she said. Everything I said was correct. <laughs> Well, in the meantime, we'll catch you next week on Nerd Talk. I'm Pixie. And I'm Pyrosim. And thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs>